Okay, Francis, would you like to start? I would, from the comfort of my kitchen. <laughs> I would like to say to everyone with us this evening, welcome. On behalf of the Napa County Library Foundation, I'm delighted that you've decided to join us and I look forward with you to hearing what John has to tell us about his work. The Library Foundation manages a portfolio for the library of donations that come from the community and we're able to give a, a, a gift to the library every year in the amount of about $50,000. We're happy to be, of, or the, I'm not sure what you call us, <laughs> the hosts of um, Art in the Library every month. I'm sorry that we don't have our normal wine and cheese for you all this evening. Maybe uh, you can grab some quickly <laughs> at home or bring it next month. Anyway, welcome everyone. Happy to have you here. Thank you, Francis. Um, well, good evening. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that you've all decided to uh, come and spend some time with us this evening. Our guest is photographer John Comiskey, and John's work is in the library this month, and it can be seen. However, things being how they are these days, it may be a little bit trickier for you to get into the library. So I am encouraging you to call us at 253-4235 so that you can make an, an appointment to come in to see John's work and to make some selections and take them home. Take a look at our library and what it has to offer and then go home and, and read them and return them when, you're, when you've, you're done with them. Each appointment you make, it's uh, for an hour of your time. So again, I'll give you that number again, 253-4235. Now we have faced some unique challenges these past few months when it comes to programming. We have done in the past in-person programming, but the last few months we've brought programming to you by Zoom. Because of the limited number of people that can come in and see John's work, um, we decided that what we would do is we would extend the invitation for John to exhibit again next year. So hopefully it will be under different circumstances you will be able to see his work you know, at will in person, and you will be able to see a program presented by John in person in our community meeting room. He's going to be exhibiting in October of 2021. So put that on your calendars because I know John is going to have some wonderful new work for you. And um, he's a wonderful photographer and I'm excited about having him come back. As for tonight's program, John is happy to take questions at any time. So if you, um, whenever you have a question, uh, take a look at the bottom of your screen. There's the Q&A section. Click on that and go ahead and type in your question. And I will read them at the appropriate moment so that John can answer them. And he is also um, willing and happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation. John Komiski, he's traveled across the world. Um, he has, his goal is to travel to every state and continent, and I think he's just about done that. He's an avid photographer, and he captures the essence of the locales he's explored through the landscapes and the wildlife that he encounters on his journeys. Um, I love his work, and I am always um, thrilled to have his work in our library. He's done a number of presentations for us, one, a couple for Art in the Library, and then some Remarkable Journeys programs. It's another program that um, I work on. So it's my pleasure to introduce John Komiski. Okay, good evening, everybody. I'll share my screen now. So, uh, good evening again, everybody. Uh, what the plan is for tonight is I'm going to go through a series of photos and I'm going to concentrate on telling you some of the stories either that the photo is about or the context around which it was taken. Now, as Stefana said, uh, some of the photos in this presentation and some not are in the exhibit that's in the library right now. And I, I have to upfront kind of confess 
that the exhibit is a bit lighter than I normally would hang uh, for the library exhibit. And that's really just because we didn't know that people would be allowed in the library yet. And so we, I did a smaller exhibit strategically placed. Uh, but the um, but many of the ones that you'll see tonight uh, are included there and the prints are larger and so maybe a little bit better than you would see on the computer screen. And the intent of the photos tonight in the stories is just to give you a sense of the range of what I tend to photograph and also a little bit about how I arrived at it. So a lot of people think of me as a wildlife photographer, and I am, uh, but not exclusively. As a matter of fact, until about six years ago when there was a turning point, I only photographed wildlife in what I called accidental intersections, where we happened to cross each other and I would snap a shot, but I wasn't really seriously taking wildlife as part of what I did in my photography work. What I did instead, uh, as I first became really serious about photography, was landscapes, what I call tricks, worlds within worlds. And I'll, I'll explain those terms to you, but uh, they all add up to a range of photography that has now grown a bit. So what are tricks? Well, first off, it's not a technical term. Trick is just a term that I use, and it's for times that happen that usually are almost excuse me, are almost uh, instantaneous and disappear practically as quickly when a scene with the colors and shape and light and form and composition changes momentarily. And by doing so, winds up telling a story or sings a, vis <clears throat> a visual song. And I'm always looking for tricks wherever I go. So I was walking uh, down the street in New York City uh, a few years ago, and it's a street I visit often actually, and I immediately was drawn to the scene that you're seeing. It was a random collection of very vibrant fruit that was clustered together in a large molded vase with a pattern, and light was coming in from outside through the window and bringing snatches of reflection in with it. And so I immediately started to set up to take a picture of it. But just as I was getting ready, two workers from nearby came over, sat down, and lit up and started to have smoke. And as I looked at it, they actually sunk into the reflection and changed the composition. So I decided that something special might come out of that, and I'd wait for a minute. And sure enough, in a few minutes, it did. Their alarms only briefly aligned in a way that allowed the image to become something else. It was then a gift from beings in another dimension, passing it into our dimension to us. Just for that second, their arms moved, but the picture was able to preserve it, and I got a chance to get the trick down. Now, another thing I like, and this uh, picture illustrates it, uh, is a quote that Ansel Adams made years ago. He said, a good photograph is knowing where to stand. And it's true. As a matter of fact, where you're standing uh, either allows the photograph to be there or the picture to be there or not at all. It could be invisible. And in this particular case, the place to stand was above. So I'm here in a helicopter and we're flying up the coast of Hawaii. And looking ahead, I notice that there are large waves breaking across a very straight rocky cliff. And as the waves hit full power into that cliff, they created rebounding waves of white water that raced out to meet the next one coming in. And I thought, you know, that probably has some pretty interesting water patterns in it. So I kept my eye on it. But it wasn't until we were directly on top of it, probably going 40 miles an hour, that I realized that there was even more going on than I had supposed. Now, I bet you all had this experience where you stood on a beach and the water was around your ankles and a wave began to form coming in and it pulled the water out from around your feet. Well, that's what actually is happening here. So if you can see my arrow, 
This is the wave coming in, which is probably about eight feet tall, and it sucked an enormous amount of water out of the bottom, and it re <coughs> revealed features of another world that you couldn't see a second before. So here is the actual rocky bottom. Here are the colors of the rocks that had golds and browns in it, etc. And it only existed for a second before the two waves collided and it disappeared. This is the one where you see the world within the world, but it probably gets created over and over again throughout the day. This is in the dry Tortugas. And when I came over the hill and saw this scene, I knew I was going to take a picture of it immediately. I mean, here you've got the, uh, the airplane on the beach, the doors open, there's no one around, and it looks like a very metaphor of paradise found, of all the color, troubles of the world dropping away. And then I look closer, and I don't know if you can see this, but it's kind of a story within a story. So in, if you get to the library and you do see the prints, you'll see this sign, uh, which took me back a little bit because it was kind of a juxtaposition to my feeling about the picture before. And if you can't read it, it says island closed. Now, <laughs> I've never encountered an island closed before. And it, as I said, was somewhat contrary to the general feel of the picture, but I took the picture anyway, as you can see and found out later it fit in perfectly. The story within the story is that the very narrow beach that surrounds that tiny atoll is the home to sea turtles who nest there. And the island is closed purely to save the turtles' nests from destruction. So it's kind of like wildlife rescue before the rescue is necessary and it fit into the entire theme, but it was a story within a story. Now, as I mentioned about six years ago, uh, I had a turning point and it evolved around uh, a couple of random occurrences, but I started talking to wildlife, Napa Wildlife Rescue here in the county. And we had a few conversations and they were interested in me considering becoming part of the board. So uh, I went up to the clinic because I wanted to understand the work better and talk to the manager we talked about several things, uh, but photography came into it. And she invited me to come out with her if I wanted to the next day, because she was going to release a small falcon called the Kestrel that you see here in the picture, and asked me if I'd uh, photograph it. So I said, sure. Now, mind you, as I said, I wasn't a wildlife photographer at that point, so my skill set uh, was unproven. But I thought I could probably do an okay job. And so we met in the morning and she took the bird out and I was absolutely successful at doing everything wrong. As a matter of fact, of all the pictures I took that day, I've only kept two. And this is one of the two, which I still use uh, often. And the reason for it is, is that this one came out and viewed this way, it forms a very clear view of the intent of wildlife rescue, the care of the human side in order to heal the wild animal and eventually release it back to its normal place out in the wild. So at this point, because of this, wildlife photography entered my repertoire. But what had to happen uh, and has over the years is I need to learn a whole new set of new skills. Uh, like tracking moving objects because wildlife tends not to pose for you. I had to buy new equipment because wildlife often will be at a distance and that's where you see long lenses show up at different events and out in the wild. And I found that both of those things never stop being something you have to continue to acquire. A bit more on the subtle side was I also had to learn emotional control. So I had to pick up a bit more patience in order to be good at it. Now, wildlife uh, in Napa is very varied. And uh, so I began by really specializing on that. It, it spread to other places later. But we have quite a few species that live here year round. 
And we also have many species that fly through in the Pacific Flyway. So there's always something going on for wildlife photography interest. One of my favorites, as you'll get from this photo, are hummingbirds. And this is what I call a plan shot in that I already knew at the start of the shooting what it was I really wanted to capture. And that was a hummingbird straight on. And if you think about it, and I bet you'll think about it after this, and you look at hummingbird pictures, most of them, the vast majority are from the side. And the reason for that is, is because the bird is actually feeding at a flower or a feeder and they pause for a moment. Their wings continue to beat very rapidly, but they pause and it's easier to get the shot. When they're free flying, as this one is in this picture though, they're moving erratically uh, and very fast. Those wings are beating from between 40 to 50 beats per second. So in order to catch it straight on, I need one to have a very fast shutter. So this is shot at 1 hundredth of a second with a little bit of a narrow point of view so I could get some of the motion left in the wings while keeping the body very crisp. And you know, when one of the reasons uh, that I wanted to get it straight on wasn't just to differentiate from other photographs, but because it's always stronger when you can see the eyes looking directly into your own eyes in an animal. The connection is much deeper, more vivid. I should have told you, by the way, when we're here uh, about the patience part, uh, it took several days coming back and, and shooting and probably a thousand photographs to met this one. Now, another test of patience was this shot that I wanted to get. Uh, if you don't recognize them, they're up in Lake Hennessy. They're called grebes. And this is a behavior that is a very dramatic mating uh, ritual that they do that's called the rush. And when they do it, they are actually literally walking on water. They're the largest vertebrae in the world that's able to do that. So for two years, I went up uh, often in the spring to Lake Hennessy to try to capture a shot of the rush that was a keeper. But for most of those times, they were either all the way across the lake, or love wasn't in the air, or when the rush happened, they had their backs to me and whatnot. On this particular day, it was a beautiful uh, morning just shortly after dawn. I saw two of them that were at, I don't know, 50 to 70 yards apart, just look at each other in a very concentrated gaze and start to move towards each other. As they got closer and closer, they were moving more rapidly. They actually formed wakes. And as they intersected, they rose into the rush. And this time, they turned my way. I was standing in the right place. Now, sometimes photographs come to you easily, like a kiss. This is in uh, Queensland, New Zealand. And uh, it was after a very rainy day. Uh, my wife and I were back in the condo we were staying in, and the storm had just finished passing through the channel between the lake that's there at Queenstown and the mountain range called the Remarkables. And the sun was just beginning to come out. I just, by accident, happened to walk by the balcony window and looked out and saw these two rainbows start to form. I immediately ran and got my camera and stood out there as they continued to do so. And it was incredible as they went to a brilliance that I've never seen before. These were the most intense rainbows I've seen in my life. They became so brilliant that at one point, you can imagine they were actually not regular rainbows. I began to make up a fantasy in my head that they were beaming travelers down to the surface, as in beam me down, Scotty. In fact, I call it beam me down. And, uh, you know, I, even after they passed, which was several minutes later, because they last for quite a while, I kept having that feeling. I kind of wondered if the next day we would be walking with travelers from somewhere else. On the other hand, some photographs make you work pretty hard to get them. 
So this is a place in New Zealand outside of Queensland called Doubtful Sound. And it took us two hours each way to get there, riding on two buses, crossing two lakes, and then two boats. It's a series of fjords that goes back for an extensive way, and there's view after view that looks like this, as well as some protected wildlife that isn't found regularly elsewhere. Now, Captain Cook actually was at this spot. Uh, he's had a few uh, experiences in the neighborhood of Australia, but he never went inside the series of fjords because he, you couldn't tell. They turned corners and whatnot. And the name actually derives from the fact that he thought it was doubtful if they went in that they might be able to catch the wind to come back out. So he never went inside and never saw any of the beauty. It was completely safe as it turns out. The waterways are wide and deep and the wind changes on the inside. So I did get to go in and I'm able to pass this glimpse off onto you. Now, some of uh, my and my wife's travel uh, dates uh, in a way in origin uh, back to a list that I started when I was 18. They didn't have the term bucket list, or at least if they did, I didn't know it, uh, but that's what it was for me. I had 10 items when I was 18 on my bucket list, and I crossed off nine of those 10 by four years later when I turned 22, but one remained. And over the years, as things came up and new uh, adventures offered themselves, the list kept getting refreshed and refreshed for decades. But that same one remained on there all the way until four years ago. And that was to dive the Great Barrier Reef. This is a, a picture that was taken as I was going out. So uh, I was going to live aboard a live aboard dive boat and it required a plane flight on a prop plane that flew over a wonder of the world at 150 feet. And it was simply incredible. And along the way, I wound up running into the visual definition of a desert island. This one's desert, but not deserted. There was one boat and a few people that were able to actually use it. Now, when I started that, uh, we were coming out of a place called Cairns up in the Northeast. And uh, we got there a few days early so that we could kind of settle in before I took off for the reef. And so I went for a run uh, on the first morning. And as I did, uh, Cairns has a bay and I was running along it. I noticed a peculiar thing because there is a beach there it's a lousy beach, to be honest with you. It's, it's mostly mud and rocks, but you know, patches of sand and whatnot. And there was not a single person on it, which was odd because there's a fair number of people in Cairns. And even though it's not a great beach to lay your towel down and get a suntan, nonetheless, you would expect that somebody would be walking it. Well, the answer to that question uh, was just a little ways up the path. I ran into a sign that said in big letters, don't go in the water, don't go near the water. And there was a painted picture of one of these guys, which is a saltwater crocodile. And it was very clear why it was people weren't going down there because even though uh, they do boat on the bay, uh, saltwater crocodiles are often in the bay and um, are, you know, a, a possibility that you don't want to turn your day into. So when I saw that, I knew that the next stop that we were going to was a town called Darwin, and that there was a, uh, a, an actual uh, facility there that displayed crocodiles, salt water. And so I made it a point that I was going to stop because I really wanted to see one live. Well, when we got there, we found that there was something better. There was a tour that actually went out into the wild and allowed you to encounter wild saltwater crocodiles, or salties as they call them. So a few days later, I was on the deck of a boat getting a very strange but serious set of instructions. The captain of the boat said first, you with cameras, don't lean over the rail to take pictures at any time. 
by the way, all of you, don't put your hands on the rail at any time. <laughs> and it was because as soon as the boat left the dock, we were in amongst uh, the territory of salties. Now this guy here is about 13 feet long and you can't see them unless they're coming along the surface. So sometimes you can follow where they are. And actually the way I was able to get this shot is this one did go along the surface for a while, but then dipped under. And once they dip under, the water is so silty, you're not able to see them at all. So you have to anticipate where in fact they may come up, have your camera ready. And I was able to capture him as he erupted out of the water. It was pretty clear why you didn't put your hands on the rail or even lean over it. What wasn't advertised on the tour though, uh, was further up river and it was incredible. This is a brown whistling kite. We have kites here in California as well. They're white and much smaller, but brown whistling kites live in colonies and they often live next to black kites. And they are the most incredible flyers I think I've ever seen. We ran into uh, part of the colony uh, upriver a ways and they circled the boat for quite a while and it was just aerial ballet. They could turn on a dime, they could make maneuvers that you didn't believe possible. But I also learned while being there that they are a lot more than flyers. They're also very smart. So there's only three raptors I know of in the world that actually practice organized hunting, meaning that they work together. Most raptors do that solely. There's one uh, in Southern, well, actually in New Mexico uh, that does it in the United States. And then there's the brown whistling and the black kite. And they're known locally as fire starters. And the reason for that is that one of the ways they hunt is whenever they encounter a fire, they go over to investigate it. And if they can find a piece of wood that's on fire on one end and not on fire on the other end, they'll actually pick it up, carry it to an area where there's a lot of undergrowth that could be disguising prey, drop it to start a fire. It's been documented. And then they get together as a group and they form a line in the direction the fire is going to travel and catch things that are running for their lives from the flames. And of course, if you're in Australia or anywhere else, there are some pictures that are simply required. This is Uluru uh, or Ayers Rock by another term. And uh, you always take pictures of it at either sunrise or sunset. I prefer those hours anyway, they're the golden hours, it's when the light's best. But the rock changes measurably uh, very rapidly. So the, uh, the advice that you get and we followed is that you take a photo every 10 seconds in order to catch the full range of changes of the light on Uluru. And then of course you pick out the ones that are your favorites. And that is sunset. So also on our list uh, was Africa. And Africa was the longest trip at that date that we'd ever taken. It was 37 hours, both directions. Uh, and it was for a photographic safari. So we were out in the bush uh, for a week. And what you wanna actually capture if you're a photographer or even just a sightseer when you are in Africa are sight of the big five. The most difficult to capture out of the big five, we're told, we were lucky in this particular case, are leopards. And so we were overjoyed in the afternoon run on this at uh, one point that we came across a tree and the guys spotted the legs of a dead impala, this impala we're looking at at the moment, up in a tree, because that meant leopards. Leopards are the only animals that have the strength, the only cats that have the strength to carry that big an animal up into a tree. And the fact that it was up in the tree and the leopard wasn't there meant that it was coming back. So at dawn of, next, of the next day, we were under the tree. The leopard was already there finishing off the rest of the impala. And after quite a few minutes had passed while that was going on, it came down 
and started to move through the brush. Now, this picture of it is caught when it paused uh, while moving through the brush, but you can catch, if you look in the background, a sense of what that environment actually looked like. It was uh, bushes that were probably, you know, shoulder height, small trees, other trees that were large, all of them had thorns, and he was walking his way through it, so we had to follow him. And in order to do that, we were driving literally over bushes that were shoulder high, trees that were taller than not, knocking them down. They grow back pretty readily, so it wasn't harming the environment. And going through groves of trees that had long branches with thorns on them. Now, the problem with that is, is that the vehicles that you're in are Land Rovers that fit about eight people. And ours uh, was one of the better ones that had a canvas top on it. So lots of scrapes went across the top of that. But we, when we went through the groves of the trees, branches would whip into the cab and you'd have to dive down into the floor because they had thorns on them. The only way to, to avoid them was to get behind the seat or down under against the door. Now, eventually he wound up coming to a set of trees climbed up one and sat down and you just got a sense that that was a favorite spot. The sun had not reached that spot yet. It was coming up and starting to hit one's uh, trees that were off to his left. And as I looked at it and watched for a few minutes, I realized that it was moving in his direction. And I believe that it might actually pass directly over him. So I quickly talked to all the rest of the occupants and the guides. Everybody had a camera, not all were professional photographers, but said, can we just wait and see if the sun hits them? Now it took 30 minutes. It was a bit of a bet, but it did. Now, the only other picture, um, I could show pictures of Africa for an hour, but the only other one I wanted to show you was this one. And there's a couple of reasons. One is because when we encountered it, it was a bird I'd never heard of. And it's regarded as one of the most beautiful birds in the world. The second is that I've never seen a more poignant expression of an emotion on a bird's face. And I'll get to why that is in just a minute. This is called a lilac crested roller. And they sit up in branches as this one is, and we came by and we were below it. So I asked the guide if he could stop so I could take some shots of it, which he did. We weren't there long, but the bird, uh, after a while, a camera will often look to a wild animal as a big eyeball and my big eyeball was pointing directly at him. And so he eventually took a look very pointedly down at me and evidenced supreme annoyance. So we wound up leaving him alone. I'd already gotten the shots, but it was also kind of a glimpse into his character. Lilac crested rollers will sit on a branch like that, waiting for prey to come by. When it does, they pounce on it, beat it to death on a rock, and swallow it whole. <laughs> so you get a bit uh, in this particular photo of the actual personality of the bird. They are beautiful though. Now that's me, so I didn't take this photo. Uh, but I'm showing it because it carries the context that makes the uh, photo become uh, more important. So I was in Roatan, which is off of Honduras, uh, with some members of my family on a week for uh, diving. And one of the features of the particular resort we were at was a shark dive. Now I've encountered sharks in the water diving before, and I've even taken some pictures of them, but none of them ever really came out. I mean, you knew it was a shark, but they were not keepers. And so I was hoping maybe this would allow me to get one that was. So we take off and it was a different boat than we'd been on uh, the previous days of the week. It was much larger. And it went around to the opposite side of the island, which is where the wind hits. So the water that day, because the winds were high, was pretty rough. And we were getting a lot of motion in the boat. Now I was set to be the first one in the water. So 
I got up and I got all my gear on the tank and the buoyancy compensator and I'm in my my fins and whatnot and I'm start wait, making my way across the boat to get to the jump off place and I'm right in the middle of the only place where there's absolutely nothing to grab onto when a wave hits the side of the boat well I bit the dust and in doing so, because they have um, you know, fairly rough decks for traction on the boats, I skinned both my knees and they were bleeding freely. So when I got myself together and I uh, went over to the jump off point, I uh, actually paused for a moment to ponder the uh, captain's briefing, dive master's briefing, I should say, about what the dive was about. And particularly one thing that he said, which was, hey, if you wound up cutting yourself this morning shaving or you had some other injury that might be using a little blood, and I know you're, you know you're diving into a group of sharks, don't worry about it. This particular species of sharks isn't attracted by human blood. Now, mind you, I'd only met this man 30 minutes before, so I had to think for a minute if I believed him. I decided I did and I jumped in. Now, there, are, of course, are many shots of this, but my underwater camera, because I'm not officially an underwater photographer, is a point shoot, a good one, uh, but it doesn't have a zoom lens. So that shark is really as close as it looks. They were about six feet long, maybe 250 pounds, and uh, there were 17 of them in all. And sure enough, even though I was bleeding throughout the entire time, they took no notice. Now, this is another bucket list travel destination my wife and I both held, and that was someday to go to the Galapagos. So we did two years ago. And in the Galapagos, uh, you probably know, and I bet somebody on the phone or on the call has been there, uh, there's a whole different line of wildlife that you'll find nowhere else. And the one that I was particularly interested in, because I've been interested in them for many years, were marine iguanas. And my photographic goal was hopefully to capture a picture of one swimming under the water. The problem happened uh, that occurred, though, was that even though I went on multiple snorkeling trips, is that the water was cool enough that we had to wear wetsuits and they didn't issue weight belts because uh, if you wear a wetsuit without a weight belt, you're absolutely buoyant. You can't go under the water even if you want to. I, I tried a couple of times and I got maybe four feet under the water and then popped to the surface like a cork. But I was able to catch one finally that was already down in feeding. Now, it's not as crisp as I would ultimately like, and that's because I'm shooting from the surface and therefore I'm moving with the water, but it really looks like a dragon under the water. And they can spend up to 10 to 15 minutes down there feeding on the algae in the bottom. So we, on our bucket list, and uh, Stefana kind of mentioned this at the beginning, it's our intent to touch on every continent in the world. And we're up to seven now, which I imagine a number of people are thinking, well, that's all there is. Uh, but it isn't. Uh, they actually declared a new continent about three years ago. It's New Zealand. And it turns out that New Zealand, the two islands that you think of as New Zealand, the North and South Island, are the tallest peaks on a sunken continent. And so we now have eight continents in the world. So Antarctica uh, is the toughest one to get to. Uh, I wonder if anybody on the, uh, the presentation has been there. It, it is absolutely another world and very worthwhile going. Uh, so I'm not gonna tell too much in the way of stories here. There were quite a few of them, uh, but Stefan has asked me to do a Remarkable Journeys presentation, April 15th, I believe. Uh, and it will be dedicated to Antarctica. But the photographic goals for the trip were these guys, penguins, and uh, you absolutely, if you go to Antarctica, you not only see a zillion pelican, uh, penguins, you fall in love with them. And whales. And ice.
Ice was the thing actually both of us thought was the most stunning about the trip. It takes shapes you wouldn't believe. Its colors and hues were just incredible, and there's a lot of it. I actually had to buy a new lens uh, to be able to take this picture because that was the largest iceberg that was in the Atlantic, Antarctic Peninsula at the time that we were down there. It's two football fields long or longer. Now, the final picture I'm going to get to um, is one that really came about because of two sets of circumstances. The first is we're all stuck at home right now. And the second is sometimes you see a picture that absolutely needs taking, but when you first encounter it, it's not complete. And so you have to go looking for the rest of it. Now the go looking for the rest of it, uh, there's a term for it actually, it's called dancing around the teacup. Means that you look from a high point, you look from a low point, you look from the left, you look from the right, you move around, you find other compositional elements and whatnot until you find the rest of the picture, which I eventually did out in front of our house. And it's a picture which will always remind me of these times. It started as just the sun as a glaring circle in the backyard. But this one, which I've called Sunfire Flower, uh, brings out both elements of the sun and the orange sky and the way things felt for the last few days in Martian kind of apocalypse. And it was a capture that I thought will always tell me anyway the story of what we've actually been going through. So now I've been telling, showing you pictures and telling you stories for a bit. Uh, if that caused uh, for a craving of even more, um, there are shots that are in the exhibit uh, down at the library that you haven't seen in this presentation tonight. I have a website. It's pretty easy to remember. It's johncomiskeyphoto.com, so just my first and last name, photo.com. And on it are pictures uh, that cover years and cover most of the globe. And I'm also presenting, not presenting, I'm one of the exhibiting artists at the Napa Artists Association Gallery down on First Street. And the artists themselves, in fact, I was down there this morning doing this, staff the gallery. So uh, it's there. It's open seven days a week. And uh, there's more work there uh, that you didn't see tonight as well. It's for sale. Um, and everything on the uh, website is for sale as well. So drop on down, who knows, we may meet in person. So Stefana, that is the end of the presentation part. All right, well, a wonderful job as usual, John, thank you. I do have a comment here, it's from Alan Goldstein. He says, great pictures, great travels, thanks, John. You're so, very welcome, Alan. It's a, wonderful, does anybody else have any, que any questions? Okay, any, 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 any open questions here? I, ha I guess I have a question, John. I know you, you've often mentioned traveling with your wife. Does she also, is she also a photographer? No, um, she's an iPhone photographer. So, and by the way, uh, iPhones can take some pretty incredible pictures, uh, particularly the new ones out. No, she, um, she allows me to do it. Um, she often will walk with me and lets me go off on my own when I need to. Uh, well, that sounds like a perfect partnership. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, somebody, I think somebody may have a question. Here we go. Let's take a look and see. Um, great presentation, uh, John, uh, from somebody, somebody named Frank. I don't see a last name, but clearly uh, it was an enjoyable program. And I'm glad to hear it. I'm guessing Frank might be one of the artists that uh, I work at times in the gallery with. He's a good friend. He said yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, two more questions, sir. Let's take a look. No, nope, those were just a great presentation and yes. All right. Okay. Yeah, oh, I see somebody on chat. 
Oh, was this recorded? Would love to see again. Fabulous. Um, yes, this presentation was uh, is being recorded and uh, it takes us a little while to get it on our website. And then I also share it with the presenters. So I'll share it with John and he can place it on his social media as well. So it will be available to you um, through the library website and through, uh, through John. And I, I should mention, by the way, thank you everyone for attending. Um, as you picked up, I uh, am with Napa Wildlife Rescue and I encourage you to check out Napa Wildlife Rescue on Facebook. Uh, not only because some of the photographs are mine that are on there, but the stories are just fantastic stories. We post usually five times or so a week and all you have to do is put Napa Wildlife Rescue in the search bar and it'll take you right in. Okay, um, it looks like Grace has something to say, so I just unmuted her. Um, Grace, did you have something to say? It says unmute, so let me unmute audio. There we go. Grace? Grace, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me now? I yes. can. Great. Okay. What type of equipment do you use? Well, right now, uh, and you, you hit me at kind of a changeover point. So um, most of everything that you saw was shot with a DSLR. Uh, if you want the detail of it, it's a Canon 5D Mark III. Uh -huh. uh, however, uh, there's a new technology that has come out, which is mirrorless cameras. And two months ago, and I'm almost getting hives waiting I ordered uh, a new mirrorless camera called the D5 from Canon, uh, which is by every report and demonstration and spec is a breakthrough. Uh, it will give me a lot more range and scope. It's, you know, for instance, I can take six shots a second now, I'll be able to take 20 shots a second with that. Uh, it has uh, much improved image stabilization and just about every single attribute of my current camera uh, will get a boost. The one problem with it is, is that um, I'll have to start buying lenses again. Uh, <laughs> there's an adapter that will allow me to use my old lenses, but um, whenever there's an adapter, there's always a little bit of a downside. So uh, I'm getting one of the new lenses uh, that comes with it and it's supposed to be a week away. I'm dying for it. Oh. Ah. I have another question here. It's from Debbie. First, she says, great presentation. Um, what is the longest you've had to wait to get a wildlife photo? Uh, the, the one of the Greaves. Uh, so two years, uh, if you want to take it over a course of time, has been the absolute longest. Um, but there are many occasions when it's taken six or eight hours and I, I walk away with the picture or without it. Thank you, John. Another, um, Douglas also says, super show. Thank you. So by the way, I, I mentioned it when I was showing the hummingbird picture, but um, if I had to add up all the hours that um, I put into that picture in segments, um, I probably had 30 hours, um, and as I said, close to 100 pictures, because I, I was looking for something very specific and you know, waiting until I had a chance at that. Uh, but uh, there was only, that was the, the best of them all, and it was exactly what I was trying to get. And um, there's another question here about next um, year's October presentation. Will it be the same or will it be different? No, I'll never do two presentations that are the same. <laughs> so um, how it will be different, I don't know. I, you know, as my wife said, luckily we, um, we got to go to Antarctica just before everything changed because um, we were on a cruise ship and, and uh, you're in a pretty remote place. And people from around the world, it was a, a small cruise ship, but people were from around the world. Uh, but we've stopped traveling entirely. Um, so I'm still obviously shooting in Napa and there's a lot of subject matter in Napa. Uh, but the trips that we had to get to the last con and we haven't been to, which is Asia or sometime in the future. Um, 
And I, I really hope that by October next year, uh, the presentation will be in person, live, and uh, it'll be in the library with the pictures around it. Well, one thing I've learned about you creative types, you wonderful artists, is that you're always, um, always learning and doing new things. So I would not expect you to do the same program over and over um, because you are out there exploring the world and showing us the world in ways that we often don't um, take the time, at least sometimes I don't take the time to notice. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, John. Thank you you're very welcome. much. And like anybody else, you're always in love with your, your latest work. <laughs> 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 you know, and, and uh, I am actually doing quite a bit of experimenting now because uh, we're stuck in place. So I'm, I've been doing some interesting stuff with double exposure and bracketing exposures and stuff like that. So as I get better at that. Uh, some of that will start showing up. So I would expect the next presentation to be entirely different. Yes. All right. Well, um, if there are no, if there are no other questions, it looks like I think we can um, end tonight's program. I do want to remind everybody that we get together on the second Friday of the month at 630 for presentations such as the one John showed us tonight. Next month, uh, we have a mixed media artist. His name is Charlie DeLemer. He's, he is from Calistoga. He will be here on October 9th, 6.30, and he will talk about his artwork. In the meantime, I encourage you to call us at 253-4235 to make an appointment so that you have the opportunity to come in and see John's work. And uh, with that, um, I bid you good night. Thank you, John. Good night.